A weird situation that probably hasn't come up yet is what happens if you try to solve a linear system, but you do it with two different sets of constants. So if you need an example to try out, here are two linear systems. The coefficients of the variables are exactly the same, uh, but the constant terms are different. So take a second, pause the video, and work out the solutions to both of these. Now I'm going to go through these pretty quickly without getting into a terrible amount of detail, but I do want to write out the steps that I've used explicitly just because I'm going to draw attention to them uh, in a second. Now hopefully you've already done this when you pause the video or you've done something similar yourself, and in that case there's nothing new happening here. And as I start out on the second linear system, what I'm hoping is that you're starting to see a pattern. Indeed, what you'll see is that I'm using exactly the same steps in the second system as I used in the first. So let's write that out explicitly because it's worth noting. Uh, the steps used in both cases were exactly the same. And note that they don't have to be the same, but you're guaranteed that if a series of steps works with one set of constants, then it'll also work with another, and that's good to know. And secondly, the steps that we choose only depended on the coefficient matrix, so it doesn't depend on the constants at all. And now, while it's not the point of this video, these two notes combine to say something interesting. So what if we created this super augmented matrix, and we did that by putting both constants beside the coefficient matrix? Well, if we put the coefficient matrix into RREF using the steps above, we get out both of the solutions with only a minimal amount of extra work. And this idea is going to be really important later. Now, the point of this video is that we can glean something else. Namely, that the number of solutions that a system admits, either infinite or unique, can be determined just by the coefficient matrix. And we saw in the last video that a system had infinitely many solutions if any of its columns failed to contain a leading one. So it seems like counting the number of leading ones might be a useful thing to define. And this leads us to the rank of a matrix, which is the number of leading ones in its row reduced echelon form. Okay, so now you don't have to use reduced row echelon form. We only choose that because we know that RREF is unique to a matrix. In practice, REF has the same number of leading ones as RREF. And in fact, you can often see the rank of a matrix before you even get to REF. So I would say don't worry about going to RREF if you can see what the rank of the matrix is prior to that. All right, so let's do a quick example here. Uh, this is a three by four matrix. Uh, let's find its rank. And again, I would say to pause the video here and get some row reduction practice in. I'm going to go straight to REF, and I'm going to do this without writing down all the steps. Uh, that way we can check uh, our answers, but we don't waste time doing the whole reduction. There are two leading ones, one in column one and one in column three. And so that tells us that the rank of this matrix is two. That's it. And we'll see in the next video how to use rank in order to character, characterize the solutions to a linear system.